Presented by Caltech. Wait till after. <laughs> um, thanks so much for inviting me, Colin. It's a real privilege to be here. And as I've said to several of you during the day, um, I have this eerie sense. It's not deja vu, because it's not sort of some sort of affective um, um, experiential phenomenon. It's a declarative sense that I, I've been to Caltech. And so if anybody here, your faces are all too young to probably have any chance of remembering when I was here. But if anybody happens to know and can scratch this itch, I'd appreciate it. Though in all likelihood, it's probably just a confabulation. Because in many ways, I could think about this as you know, um, a, a home crowd of sort or a sibling crowd. Because I live in an environment you know, sort of suffused with Caltechies of one sort or another. Um, and they talk about it so much, you know, beginning with John Hopfield, you know, and, and you know, down to Mala Murthy and, and, and Tim Taylor and others, that maybe I just sort of have um, created this, uh, you know, reconstructive memory that I've been to Caltech. And I think it's probably exacerbated by the fact that my brother-in-law is also a Caltechie. Um, so maybe that's it. I don't know. But as I said, if anybody happens to ever remember having seen me here, I'd really like to know why and when. <laughs> um, anyhow, thank you for coming. Um, and. Uh, as Colin said, I, you know, I have a fairly broad set of interests in how the mind works. Um, I was afraid you were going to tell the tale of um, the, the, the <laughs> I don't know if you were in the room with the, with the, the showdown with uh, Ghoul and Pessendorfer. Um, all right, well, that's for dinner. I'm not going to tell that one here. Um, but um, all of it sort of centers on my interest in what, in, if I put it in a slightly grandiose term, though hopefully I'll give some, some meat to that, makes us human. What is it about our ability to act as agents that, what's at the core of that, if there is anything? And I think there are at least some things that we can point to that are. And I, my, my interest has always been in how can we not only try and characterize it, but more importantly, formalize it. Commit it to a formal understanding, ideally in terms of mechanisms, and, and, and ideally in terms of mechanisms that we can um, you know, relate to the actual physical substance that's doing it, namely the brain. You know, various points I sort of vacillated between what the right level of analysis is. There's a whole discussion to be had about that, which I would love to have if anybody's interested afterwards. Um, but it's all organized, in my mind, around this attempt to understand what, for lack of a better term, I'll call cognitive control. Um, and so I don't know how many people are psychologists and how comfortable people are with this term. It, it can be viewed as a pretty vague term. So let me take a gander at defining it for you, at least loosely, and then maybe sort of beginning to narrow it down, at least as, how, as I think about it. Um, so here's sort of a broad get-in-the-game definition. It's the ability to flexibly guide behavior in accord with mentally represented goals or intentions. And it's usually in greatest relief when those intentions come into conflict with um, otherwise compelling response tendencies. And I know this is my favorite example. Um, if I were to tickle you with a feather or notice that you had a mosquito bite and I saw you about to scratch, I could tell you, don't scratch. Two words, half a second. I don't know, maybe Marcus can tell me how many synapses or, or action potentials are involved, maybe a handful, and you cannot do it. And if you, it seems silly, it seems sort of trite, but if you think about it, it's actually really profound. First of all, it is something that you can do with almost no information. Two words, right? Some, disturbances of some sound, you know, some molecules, it hits your tympanic membrane, again, a few action potentials, and suddenly you can not do something. But what you're not doing is, is something that overrides something on the order of two to 300 million years of evolution. So it's not only something that you can do quickly, but you're overriding this unbelievably powerful force, right, as evidenced by this. As far as we know, every mammalian species, and it may be even some reptilian species, right, scratch. It's a reflex in the most definitional sense of a reflex. And yet, with two words, in under half a second, you cannot do it. Right? And maybe you've done it, maybe you've not done it in this case before, or maybe you haven't. But the fact is, even if you haven't, you cannot do it. And so if there's any sort of distillation of what cognitive control is, for me, that's it. Okay? So how does this happen? Well, as I've already suggested, it's, a uniquely, it's uniquely developed in, in people. Um, well, I've already said this, I guess. Um, it's also, and here's sort of the beginnings of the argument that it's, it's sort of at the core of what makes us human, 
it seems to be implicated in every human behavior that we consider to be characteristically human. And so these are all sort of tasks that I think we can say distinguish us um, to greater or lesser degree from every other species. Um, oh, I should have said also that you know, as much as every species scratches, there's not a single species that you can give two words to and, tell it not, and get it not to scratch. Maybe you can train it after thousands or hundreds of thousands of trials not to, but certainly not out of the box the way I can do with you. Right? Now you could say, well, that's just language, but aha, exactly. Right? Um, these are all tests. This, I can make this a test as how good a cognitive psychologist you are, but these are all the tests that are used to test these things, you know, canonical, widely used tasks. And cognitive control is implicated in every one of these. And so again, what, what's going on? Um, it's also the intellectual foundation of understanding human behavior in many um, domains. Um, it, the distinction between controlled and automatic processing is a theoretical cornerstone of cognitive psychology, and I'll, I'll come back to that in just a moment. Um, it's also the antecedent, I am proud to say, and I have it on authority in just about all of these cases, well, in two out of the three cases, that in fact is exactly isomorphic with what is meant by these terms that you see more commonly used in economics, like system one versus system two, or deliberative versus reflective, or most recently in the lay literature, you know, <laughs> thinking fast and thinking slow. And you know, I, I, when Danny first talked about this work, um, I, I was sort of both intrigued, but also a little bit disturbed. And afterwards, I went up to him and said, you know, Danny, you're talking about these things in these other terms, but you, know, you spent the first part of your career and actually made your career studying attention and cognitive control. He wrote the book you know, um, uh, about it at one point. Um, and so why are you changing the terms? Is there something new here, something different? And his answer was no, but if you're a psychologist, economists don't listen, so we had to make up new terms. <laughs> so at least as far as Danny is concerned, these are literally isomorphic terms. Okay? Um, I also think that um, it's very closely related to, if not isomorphic, and it might even be isomorphic, with terms in sort of more traditionally formal disciplines like computer science, and we'll talk about control theory in just a moment, that I think capture very similar properties, if not exactly the core properties that we are striving to describe when we talk about control versus automatic processing. In this case, I'm referring to something like interpreted versus compiled. And I won't say much more about this, though I will come back and say something about some of the things we've learned about how humans manage this um, distinction between control, or how the brain manages this distinction between control and automatic processing, and consequences that may, be, may have um, for informing machine learning in the future. Um, and yet, there is a fundamental unanswered question um, regarding its simplest, most obvious, most general, and I would argue most embarrassing feature, namely the radical constraints on its engagement. Okay? There are actually laws about this. Right? You can't talk on the cell phone and drive at the same time. You're not allowed to. Apparently, you are still allowed to make coffee and drive at the same time. Um, maybe not so wise, uh, but it is a fundamental feature of who we are. Now, what's interesting is there's some things that we can do, you know, m many things that we can do at the same time. So I'm gesticulating while I'm talking, and I can even spin this pen and catch it while I'm continuing to talk with you. Right? There's lots we do, all in parallel. And yet there's this subclass of tasks, like, for example, doing mental arithmetic and planning a grocery list that we can't. Right? And so I'm going to come back, and that's in fact what the talk is about, but I just want to take a little discursion into the history of, of where the term cognitive control comes from, at least in the psychological literature, because um, I think it's instructive and it sets us up, I think, in a way to start to answer this question. So the term control first emerged in physics. Um, uh, Maxwell used it to describe what he called governors and the properties of those governors that affected other parts of the system by parameterizing them in ways that led to interesting behaviors like oscillations and stability versus instability conditions. Um, though I think more commonly when we think about control in engineering, we think about Norbert Wiener who sort of codified the notion of control as an interesting mathematical problem and developed a field that he called cybernetics to study that. Um, and in fact, interestingly, um, and as one might have hoped, psychologists, the early psychologists that first started talking about planning and behavior and cognitive control were informed and inspired by this kind of work. Um, and in fact, there was a book written, Planning and the Structure of Behavior, by um, George Miller, Carl Prebrum, and I forget Glantner's first name because he's always, he's the sort of forgotten of the trio, um, that literally expressed planful behavior in humans, a theory of it, in terms of a very simple control system, the simplest ones that you can imagine, which is sort of this test and operate, 
um, loop until you satisfy the test and then you, you exit. Right? It's called the tote model. And it's not clear to me entirely why this didn't take hold and continue to be sort of the theoretical foundation for studying cognitive control. You know, one reason may be that people, graduate students, found it scary, both in the sort of mathematical sense and, I don't know, maybe even the affective sense, because these are the first pictures you pull off the web of these folks. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, George is actually was an incredibly nice and friendly guy. Prebrim might have been a little bit scary. I we had a chance to meet him once, and I'm not sure that was a, <laughs> an unfair characterization of him. But George was a really incredibly nice guy. Um, so I don't know whether that was it, um, or conversely, it was the very friendly face that two other groups of psychologists, well, one individual and, and another pair, um, brought to the study of control. And the first one was Mike Posner, who was the first person to sort of talk about it in the context of empirical um, empirical phenomena. So whereas Miller, Prieber, and Grant, uh, Galantner had a sort of a theory of control, and they referred in sort of in abstract form to the kinds of behaviors they were interested in, plans, right, goals and sub-goals, they weren't actually collecting data, at least on human performance, that they used it for, as far as I'm aware. At least that wasn't sort of the main thrust of their work. But for this guy, it was. And he sort of um, described cognitive control in terms of a very specific experimental paradigm, which we'll come to in a moment. Um, and established a very rich tradition of study of control um, based on a qualitative definition, which we'll also come to in a moment, um, and made really experimentally rigorous, perhaps um, by these guys even more so, uh, Rich Schifrin and Walt Schneider. And if people, those of you who are interested in this domain don't know their work, their pair of 1977 psych review papers, they are landmarks. I mean, and really, you can't consider yourself a cognitive psychologist if you haven't read these um, cover to cover. I mean, they're just the most exquisite example of a really careful, methodical line of experimental work that parses out what functions could be going on and what they look like um, and how to sort of quantitate them of any I know in psychology. Um, unfortunately, though, the interpretation they placed on this work, as did Posner, was heavily influenced by the observation that there was a limited capacity for control, right? That you could only, in the, they, they, in fact, it became definitional. That something was controlled if you could only do um, that when you weren't doing it with something else at the same time that was controlled. So yes, I can do mental arithmetic while I breathe, right? But I can't do a mental arithmetic and plan a grocery list at the same time. So that qualifies both of them as being controlled, right? Because I can't do them both at once. And this, and it really is the, ultimately became the, in the Kuhnian sense, the paradigmatic definition of control. This is how we study it in the laboratory using dual task designs, right? Um, and, and, and I think the theoretical interpretation was heavily influenced by sort of the advent of the CPU and the whole notion of serial processing as the primary paradigm for, for, for trying to understand computation and build computational theory. Um, and so very quickly, it became assumed that the reason for the capacity constraint um, and control was a constraint on the CPU itself. So a CPU or a core, we call it these days, is defined in some sense by having a single register or a very small number of registers and only exercising one program step at a time, right? Um, and so there was this notion that maybe that's the, the, the explanation for human cognitive uh, capacity constraints and human cognitive control, just like it's the CPU, right? That's the CPU of the brain. And everything that needs control relies on it, and you can only do one at a time, and there, have, there you have the constraint, okay? Um, so I already said, you know, it became paradigmatic uh, uh, sort of as a, as, a, as a way of operationalizing control in the laboratory. Um, this idea of a CPU got sort of codified in more psychologically palatable form um, as the ACT-R model using production systems and uh, <coughs> production system models, essentially symbolic models that are used to describe sort of chunks of behavior that people can perform and memories that they use um, that, that, that that performance relies on. It's really just an operationalization of this notion of a CPU, okay? Um, at least the control part of it. Um, and then, um, as I said, sort of a, a rich tradition of empirical validation of this idea, the most sort of famous of which is the psychological refractory period that I won't talk about, but that became sort of the, the canonizing finding that established that really there is a central limited capacity upon which all control processing relies that makes it serial, okay? Um, so uh, that, there was like 30 or 40 years of this, but it's sort of an unsatisfying account, and I'll come back to that in a moment. 
But before I do, I just want to sort of bring it full circle and say that with that notion, there has been a recent return to um, sort of the formal roots of thinking about control. And I, I, I'm proud to be um, sort of collaborating with people um, that, have, uh, particip that have been sort of leading that charge, Matt Bonzinik and, and Amitai Shenhav, who was, um, when we wrote this paper about the expected value of control, which made the assumption that control processing um, was limited, and so how do you decide what to allocate it to? Well, based on an expected utility, or in this case, expected value of control as opposed to the behavior itself, where you discount the cost or effort <laughs> put into control. Um, uh, and and that, that was a paper that Amitai um, sort of led the way on, and he's now actually a faculty member at Brown. Um, and then this has sort of been paralleled by work by Tom Griffiths and his student Falk Leader in what they've called rational meta-reasoning. And it's work that's also been sort of based on, on in, in their case, um, the control theory equivalents in the computer science world of, of um, you know, calculating the expected value of computation. So you might have an optimal solution that you can compute, but if it takes you 10 years to compute it and you have to make a decision in five seconds, it's not very useful. Right? So there's a whole computation, you could do sort of a meta computation about how worth it it is to, and how much detail it is worth doing an evaluation um, with respect to the time frame over it which has to be done, that is the cost of computing itself. And that bears a very close relationship, an intimate relationship to this. And we have actually a more recent paper, I think it was in 2017, that's sort of the, the union of all these authors talking about what sort of a unified way of thinking about these things, and in particular where the costs come from or what you know, we often think about as mental effort. Um, so if you're interested in this, you could, you could sort of track that down, down that paper. Um, and as I've said, we, this, this framework construes um, control in terms of a cost-benefit analysis, um, and the cost is essentially an opportunity cost. Why? Because you can only do one thing at a time, so if you do this, you can't do that. It's just like a portfolio manager for only a certain amount of money, right, to invest. If I invested in Apple, I can't invest it in Google, right? So if Google goes up, even if Apple goes up a little bit, if Google goes up more, you sort of missed your chance, right? So there's been a fair amount of progress formulating ideas about how control is allocated and how people decide what tasks they want to invest control in using this. Um, and again, the logic is that if you can only perform one task, then you know, opportunity costs represent um, you know, a, a, an important quantity. And, and this allows us to sort of characterize things in terms of sort of a form of bounded rationality, optimization of the, um, the choice in the face of limited control. Ah, here's the reference. No, it's not, sorry. Should have put up the reference to the, to the more recent paper. But it still doesn't explain the limitation itself, right? So, you know, why is the capacity limited? And generally, there's these two kinds of explanations. There's one that's just flat out idiotic, I think, that's metabolic, right? And the other is this structural one, which is essentially the CPU idea, that you only have one core, right, for control processing, and that's what the constraint is, okay? But I, I said silly, and I should have said unlikely. <laughs> I think it's silly. Um, Metabolic, well, there's vast areas of neocortex, like the visual cortex, that are running all the time using you know, all kinds of energy for doing important stuff like you know, visual processing that are running not all day but all night because you dream in technicolor, right? But you, know, you invest all the energy in visual information processing but not in something like presumably pretty important like planning, right? Or, or reasoning or problem solving. That, that just, I don't know, it just doesn't seem right. And I think there are also pretty good biological reasons to think that if there are any additional costs, they're on the margins, like by several orders of magnitude. Um, and that just doesn't seem like the right answer. And, but I think the other one, and this sort of makes a similar point, is, is, is more compelling. You know, okay, so the PFC is about a third of the neocortex, and the first approximation, you know, maybe 30 billion neurons or something like that, call it 10 billion, call it 1 billion, right? 1 billion cores, one thing. Well, evolution would be a pretty bad engineer <laughs> if it designed things that way, right? That it can't do two two-digit arithmetic problems at the same time, which pretty much my watch can do, maybe before the watch anyway. I think this is still one core. But if I had two cores, that'd be it, right? And yet, you know, we've got a billion, 10 billion, 30 billion cores, and we can't do two bits of arithmetic at the same time. It just doesn't add up. It just doesn't seem likely. It doesn't seem plausible. And in any event, it didn't seem satisfying to me. So, right, really? I don't think so. Um, so I think the question begs a more rational account, and that's really the purpose of this talk. And there's actually a hint, to be fair, early in the sort of the, the um, 
in the, formalize, the formulating of thoughts about cognitive control around the time of Posner and Schneider and Schiffer and Schneider um, that was championed by Alan Allport and um, these guys, Nivon and Gopher, and, and picked up more recently by, um, um, by Meyer and Kiris at University of Michigan. Um, that roughly comes under the heading of the multiple resources idea. And the idea is that the constraint isn't in the controller itself. It's in the processes that you're asking to be performed at the same time. And so they called it the local or multiple resources idea to contrast with the notion of a single centralized resource that the controller is relying on, like that register or CPU. No, it's not that you only have one core, one register, one CPU. It's that you have things that are coming into conflict in the periphery that cause the problem under certain task settings and not others. And there's a classic illustration of this um, in a study done by this guy Schaefer in the mid-70s in which he asked people to dual task. And he had them do um, two different pairs of tasks using the same inputs and the same outputs. So in one case, he had them echo what they were listening to on a pair of headphones. So listen what, they're, you know, what, what was coming in, the, in their ears, and then just say that out loud. And then at the same time, sit at the typewriter and type. And you know, it takes you 10 or 20 minutes, especially if you're a good typist, maybe I don't know, 10 minutes to get good at this. But you can get pretty much near perfection in doing that. On the other hand, if you just cross the tasks, so now you take the auditory stream and ask the person to generate a manual output. So you ask them essentially to take dictation, hear something and type it, right? And at the same time, simply read out loud. Look at what's on the page. So take the visual input, but now map it to the verbal output, right? And by the way, I'll note that word reading was considered by many the canonical example of an automatic task, right? And we'll see that in just a moment. Um, you get a very different result. That turns out to be not only hard, but pretty much impossible. And I, I heard recently that somebody actually trained themselves to do this, and it took them 10 years to do. Um, and so why would that be? Well, the multiple resources says, look, there are these two resources, not just control, but there are these two actual representational resources, pools of, of units, whether you know, neurons you want to call them, or, or, you know, or, or representational codes more abstractly, that you need to do these sorts of things. And so if the task is echoing, you have to take the auditory input and encode it in this phonologic code, right? And then you can use that immediately to generate a verbal response. And similarly, if you have to type something, um, copy type, then you take the visual input, you represent it orth orthographically, and then that allows you to generate a manual response. And there's no problem because these resources aren't being put to dual use, right? On the other hand, when you flip the input-output relationships, now you've got a problem. In fact, you've got double the problem. If you need to take dictation, you have to encode it still auditorily in, ph in phonologic form, right? But now it has to be translated into an orthographic code to generate the manual response. And conversely, to read, you have to encode it orthographically, but translate it into a phonologic code to generate a verbal response. Now, things didn't have to be configured this way, but it seems like a reasonable way to configure things, and we'll dig in on that a little bit later, too. If it is configured this way, you can see the problem, right? If the word and, that you're hearing and the word that you see are not the same, now, somewhere along the way, there's going to be trouble if you don't exactly time things properly, OK? And so there's interference, and if we're not good at timing these things, then we can't do it very well. And so that was the account. It's not the a constraint on control. It's the fact that these involve shared use. There's a sharing of the representations for these different pathways right? that's causing the problem so that when you try and invoke two of them at once, you can't do it. Okay? So here's the first main thesis of this talk. Shared representations pose the risk of control. Control serves to present such conflict. Okay. It makes sure that you don't try and do something stupid like take dictation and um, read at the same time, lest you embarrass yourself. Um, that the constraints on processing is therefore the purpose of control, not a limit, not, not a limitation. It's like blaming control for being limited is like blaming the fireman for the fire. The fireman's always there when there's a fire, but the fireman didn't cause the fire. The fireman is actually there to take care of the fire. So blaming control for always being engaged when you're having problems with conflict Right? And, 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 and sort of being associated with having to limit processing to one thing is a reflection of that's what control is doing, not that control is the limiting factor. It's limiting factor in the, in, in the sense that it is imposing limit because there's some other problem that, you know, that would be, you'd be subject to if you didn't. Right? And so this inverts the standard interpretation. Control reflects a bound on rational processing rather, sorry, it reflects a rational bound on processing rather than a bound on rational processing. Okay? little inversion, but I think it totally changes the picture. And so that's really what the main thesis of this talk is and what the next sort of 
part of it will be about. So the purpose of, of control is to manage um, conflict from crosstalk. And here's, oh, shoot, I blew it. Ah, OK, well, so this is the Throop effect. I, I have to say it with a lisp, because I, I gather that there's somebody named Throop who named the pond. <laughs> And I, he must have named it after J.R.R. Stroop, the most famous psychological phenomenon um, you know, in the literature, and just had a lisp. I, that's all I can imagine. So um, I, I just gave away the, the punchline. I apologize. <laughs> but um, well, I can't do it. What I would have done is asked you in, to do something that normally you don't do with the Stroop effect, for those of you who know it, which is to simply respond to the stimulus out loud. And I'll just go ahead and ask you to do it. Just, just respond to this out loud. No trickery here. Just say it. Yeah, OK, so there's one guy who's trying to be a wise ass. But basically, all of you say green, right? This is like scratching. This is the canonical automatic response, right? You see a word, you say it. You weren't born with it, so it's not a reflex like scratching. But it was sort of, you know, sort of pounded into you from the time you were five until, you know, till the age you are now. And yet, if I ask you to name the color, and this is, of course, the more famous Stroop effect, you can do it, but you have a hard time. It takes you about 150 milliseconds to say red to that. It takes you 150 milliseconds longer to say red to that than to read the word. And this is probably the most robust phenomenon and certainly um, the most studied phenomenon in all of psychology. Okay? So why would, um, wh you know, what's a model that would explain this? Well, here's a very simple model that I actually began my career with. So Colin was exactly right. I don't know if you were prescient or you just know me too well. <laughs> in knowing that I, I can't give a talk without sort of revealing my roots in, in sort of this man's thinking, Jay McClelland and his, and his colleague, Dave Rommelhart, who brought us essentially deep learning, although they're, not off, they're often not credited with that. They are the guys who pretty much did it. Um, and this was sort of an early, well, not very deep learning model of the Stroop effect, where we simply supposed that there were two pathways to first approximation, one for taking, you know, frequencies of light and mapping them through some sort of hidden unit or intermediate or associative representations onto something that codes for verbal responses and similarly for little squiggles on a page that encode that. So this maybe is like V4, well, roughly speaking, and maybe this visual word form area. Both of these map onto some area that allows you to actually express a response. And of course, if I just now run, and, it, and, and presumably you've had more experience doing this by the time you're 20, you know, by the time you're 20, you're not walking around the world saying, look, mommy, mommy, red fire truck, right? But you are reading as we are right now and, and evoking, at least implicitly, phonologic um, codes for that. And we know that for sure now with, with imaging in hand. Um, so this is a stronger pathway than this. If I just put on this stimulus and that stimulus, as I did a few minutes ago, this is going to win out and you're going to say green. Right? And yet, you have the capacity to override that, so we need some other part of the system that um, allows us to say, look, oh, and of course, I can't do both at once, because otherwise, I'd say red, I'd say gred or ream, and then I'd be embarrassed, or you wouldn't know what I was saying. Right? So I need control in order, in the presence of a stimulus like this, to pick one of these two things and pick that as the thing I'm going to respond to. And the first approximation, that's the idea of what something like the prefrontal cortex, along with all of its friends um, in the brain, are doing. They're selecting out whatever happens to be the task-relevant pathway by presumably encoding some instruction, representing that in some form that conveys the right signals, activity, presumably, to favor one response, the less sort of well-trained response, um, uh, oh, sorry, the, the, the desired response over the, 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 the sort of um, more trained response. And so in that sense, the purpose of control is exactly this, to limit the crosstalk here. Now, this is at the output system. This is like telling you, well, if I tell you to put your arm to the left and put your arm to the right at the same time, like, you know, reach for the door and also reach for the microphone, you know, you can't, you can't do it. That's a physical constraint in the world. This is in some sense a physical constraint. You only have one mouth, so why should you have two phonologic codes, right? But as I suggested earlier, this is not a limitation that only exists on the output end. It's not just a constraint of output dimensionality. There's no reason why, in principle, you couldn't plan your grocery list and do um, you know, two-digit arithmetic at the same time in your head. There's no output constraints, right? Um, and similarly, with the example that I gave of the shadowing and dictation um, and echoing, et cetera, right? there were no output constraints there. There were two inputs mapping each to separate outputs, and both were available as the first example demonstrated. There's something about the internal representations that was constraining it, not the output dimensionality. Okay? And so, and, and this is just demonstrated here. If I were to give you a new task, as I will shortly, um, which is to take a word and then just point in a direction based on the words. So if you see red, point left, and if you see green, point right, right, there's no reason in principle why you couldn't do that at the same time as this, unless you have a pathway like this, right, which now is going to cause trouble. Right? So the sharing of excuse me, this representation for this sort of standard, well-trained pathway, and maybe this new one, 
right, is going to cause you trouble. Right? That shared representation is going to open up this pathway so that you can't do these two things at once. It's very similar to what I showed you um, in, in, in the Schaefer experiment. Right? Um, so yeah, and so you could solve it by separating the representations, but I will provide you evidence. In fact, you will provide me with evidence shortly that you don't do this. In fact, that you do um, this. Okay, so. Um, I think this is a sophisticated audience enough that I don't need to sort of give a metaphor, but, but often I'll talk about this as a similar problem that engineers have with regard to building train tracks or roads, right? If you have a lot of tracks or roads that you want to build, at some point you're going to face the problem of them having to cross each other, right? And so what you could do is just build overpasses, right, to ensure that the traffic flows to all their destinations, but that's both expensive, right, and it's not very flexible. If you want to be able to flexibly go from one sort of road onto another or go straight, you can't do that. You're going to build something like this. You're going to build intersections, right? But those intersections come with a peril, which is conflicts. And so this is, I think, really more than a metaphor. I think it's the same problem. And some of the math, um, mathematical analyses and graph theory analyses that we've done to try and analyze this in, in neural networks uh, that I'll just mention in just a moment have actually begun to find traction in spaces like this. And when we've looked, in the literature, we, found, we haven't found any solutions that were useful to us, but, but, but clearly there are homologous problems that people have struggled with. And, and in fact, we're starting to get invited to give talks in telecommunication settings and in system design, bus design settings, based on some of the, based on some of the observations we're making about sort of the management of, of neural pathways and, and, and this, sort of, this sort of problem. OK, so, so I already said that. So, so you could ask, though. Um, in a system as big as the brain, oh, sorry, I should say that people have thought about it this way. There's multiple resources idea. As I said earlier, I think um, Meyer and Kiris were sort of aware of it, and then more recently, um, a, a couple of people from Carnegie Mellon, I, I think they're not, neither of them is Carnegie Mellon anymore, I think they were both postdocs there when they, when they did this work, though, in John Anderson's lab, um, have used production system models to sort of make this point, that, that there are scheduling constraints when you have conflicts in the quote-unquote periphery that might constrain parallelism more than just the constraint of a single sort of centralized control mechanism which exists in, in these production systems models. But it's sort of a nice place to show that because even even where there's a centralized constraint, most of the problem isn't that. It's the scheduling problem of the local resources. Okay? But the problem is that these all sort of have these pre-specified processing architectures. Um, they're not very neural, and so quite honestly, they were less interesting to me. But most importantly, the engineers built the systems to sort of make the point rather than showing that there's something about the way the system self-organizes that leads to that. And that, the latter to me is a much more both appealing scientific explanation and also I think one that's much more likely to capture what's going on in the brain because nobody's sitting there designing the brain. Maybe genes are playing a role, but I doubt it's at this level. So, um, so this begs the following two questions. Um, how does parallel processing capability or the capacity to sort of avoid these sorts of conflicts or sharing scale with both the frequency and the network size. And an intuition you might have is that if you have a big enough network, the likelihood of you know, sort of collisions is going to be low, because you'll always find some way to get from point A to point B without sort of crossing over um, you know, somebody that's trying to get from point C to point D. But it turns out that at least the first approximation, and under certain assumptions, that's radically wrong. Um, and that it is actually tremendously constraining, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But there's a second question that it asks, which is, why, if that's true, and, and, and sharing is a really um, constraining influence on your ability to parallelize, why would you share at all? And the last part of the talk will be about that. Okay, so I think connectionist models can indeed address these questions at a level of granularity, and yet still sort of staying close to principles that, um, that, that, that sort of the standard symbolic models have not done such a good job at. And so I guess I already said this, there's an intuition that a large network might be able to share a lot of, um, um, sh support a lot of sharing without a risk of crosstalk. Um, and so we can ask that question quantitatively. And the answer, as I'll show you in just a moment, is that it, 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 that intuition is wrong if you had it. It scales really horribly badly. Okay? And even mon modest amounts of sharing dramatically limit multitasking. Okay? So how can I, why do I have confidence in saying that? Well, we've done a bunch of formal work, and I won't go into this in great detail, though this would have been a good place to do it. Um, and maybe I should have. I wanted to cover more ground than just that. Um, but I will just sort of take you through at least one of the original 
numerical studies and then show you some results from both numerical as well as now, um, in some cases, closed form analyses and in other cases, sort of graph theory analyses of more complex systems, all of which converge on just almost identical results. Okay, so the first story in this was just to ask numerically, um, what happens if you have a network that has a bunch of different pathways? So consider each of these, for example, a drift diffusion model of a t two alternative force choice task. And I can have sort of a dedicated one for each of several possible tasks. But for efficiency, I might want to sort, oh, and I can control each one. So I can turn each one on, right? Um, or any or all of them on. And now, but for efficiency, I might want to say, well, this input might be useful for that output in some cases, and similarly here. And so now, as I build more such sort of overlap or sort of divergence or in graph theoretic terms sort of I add to the node degree of the, of the graph, um, what happens to what the optimal policy is over how many of these to run on average, right? So in um, this case, obviously it pays to run all five and I can, I can operationalize that um, by asking um, what maximizes the aggregate reward rate, and I can optimize each one of these, because with the drift diffusion model, I know how to do that. I can find the exact optimal parameters given what the expected you know, inputs are for maximizing the rate at which this thing gives me a response relative to its accuracy. Right? I can maximize the reward rate for each of these. I can do it under any given control policy, whether I turn one of these on, two of these, or all five of them on. Right? And I, I can, now I can ask, given that, for any given configuration of inputs and architectures, what's the control policy? How many of these is optimal to turn on, right, relative to that, that objective function, that loss function, that is the optimization of aggregate reward rate, okay? And so when we do that, and we vary things like this, uh, we get plots like this. And as I said, I won't go through this in detail. These are the numerical results from that original simulation model. And then these are the results of at least one subset of about, I don't know, five different ways of doing the graph theory analysis um, that we've gotten. So just let me sort of talk you through this one. This is the degree of pathway overlap. So how much of that fan out did we put in the model, right? And so this is the percentage of the number of possible pathways. And this is the optimal number of processes it is it, it, um, that, that the analysis, the sort of dense optimization of the system tells us um, is, is right to turn on. And then the different colors are different size networks. And you can see it's almost scale invariant, right? So at the time, we couldn't do 1,000 except for one simulation. It took like a month to run that simulation. Because we're, again, we're doing totally dense you know, um, optimization. It all has to be numerical because there's, there's no closed form solutions for the reward rate optimization of the drift diffusion model. Um, well, it's actually, I don't want to get too technical here, but it's actually a leaky accumulator model because we thought that was even more sort of likely to not give us this result. We were looking for the best excuse to not get the result, and it still works. It, now we could probably go back and do these simulations, but the, uh, you know, more densely. But you can see that it's really draconian, right? So if you have only about 20% overlap among pathways, so that each input only maps to about 20% of the possible outputs, right? then there's a numerical, it's not a percentage, there's a numerical number of processes that's optimal. And it doesn't matter whether you have 100, you know, 20, 40, 60, 100, or 1,000 processes, you should only have about, I don't know, 15 to 16 processes turned on. Now, that's a lot compared to the one that I was talking about, but there's a lot of ways you can get to one. First of all, this was with you know, linear systems. The, the DDMs one, DDM ones were linear, the, the, the LCA ones were, were, were not exactly. Um, but uh, they also assumed sort of um, discrete codes. They only had two inputs and outputs. They weren't multi-choice. And all of the factors that we invoked for simplification so that we can make it tractable to analysis are ones that should have favored more possible pathways, right? And so when you, when you relax any of those assumptions, it makes the whole problem worse. And then there's a sort of subtler, but I think ultimately maybe the most important factor, which is that this is the maximum number if you pick exactly the right ones to do, right? But what's the likelihood that in a given circumstance you're gonna encounter exactly that set of inputs that we're gonna allow you to, to pick exactly those three tasks to do? Well, you can sort of now throw in the likelihood, sort of the likelihood distribution of combinations of tasks over the power set of all possible combinations, and then ask what's the expected likely number of things that you can do, and that just very quickly becomes one, right? So the likelihood that you're going to be able to do two things at once that involve, that, that, that require, you know, um, that, that, that are at risk of having shared representations, things that you haven't hardwired to be isolated and on their own, is, is, is pretty much one at, at the peril of screwing up. 
And then this, as I said, these are, in small systems we can do, and with under, under linear assumptions, we can actually now do closed form analyses. Um, the minute it gets um, nonlinear or larger, you end up with an NP-hard problem because, as I said, there, you have to consider the power set of possibilities. It's a combinatorial problem, and so um, even even you know doing sort of numerics becomes intractable. And so there are approximations using graph theory. So I don't know. If people are interested. You can ask me about this later. I can tell you exactly how we did this. But the quick version is that we, we can construct sort of the the original task model, neural network model, or DDM model as a bipartite graph, and then from that construct what's sometimes called a line graph, or we call an interference graph, which is what are all the tasks that interfere based on the mappings from inputs to outputs, and then the problem of parallel channel capacity reduces to the one of finding the maximum independent set on the square of the line graph, and that's a known NP-hard problem. But it's also one that people are interested in solving because it has implications, as I said, in other domains, like how many routers do you need you know, to cover a space without risking conflict, blah, blah, blah. And, and this is the domain in which, as I said, we're starting to sort of find things that, that have a broader interest when, when you have these sort of parallel routing problems. And in all cases, every analysis that's been done, it looks like this. It's just, it's just like absolutely draconian and it almost always asymptotes to fixed numbers, scale invariant. Okay, so. Um, I'm going to skip this because I feel like I'm running a bit behind. Uh, and I think I had, I thought I had a little, eh, all right, whatever, let's skip over. Um, it, it turns out that this way of analyzing things gives us a really powerful way of analyzing imaging data and exploiting the analyses to find out what the multitasking capability is of people without having to worry about the combinatorial explosion of possibilities. So just in, in a word, if you imagine an airline pilot that has you know, 30 instruments and 150 widgets, or 150 instruments and 30 widgets that they've got, and, you know, and, and their challenge is multitasking. I, I was on a flight recently, I was sort of st stuck trying to get in, you know, you always get stuck at the bottleneck right where you're getting on the plane and everybody's doing their bags at the, in the first class and, you know, you're sitting at the back waiting to get there. And the pilot happened to be standing there and I sort of looked in and I was curious how many instruments there were and I asked him and he told me this 30 and 150 number comes from the pilot that I actually asked. And then he looked at me sort of like warily and said, you know, why are you asking? And I said, well, I'm a neuroscientist and I'm interested in, in, in multitasking. And, he, and his eyes lit up and he said, this is a quote, multitasking are us, right? So if you asked, like, when you wanted to train this guy, or when he comes in the door wanting to be a pilot, what are his multitasking capabilities in this domain? The permutation of 30 input, oh, sorry, 150 input dimensions by 30 output dimensions is like more numbers than there are in your calculator, right? I mean, it's just, it's, it's, an, it's an inexhaustible, I mean, an, uh, sorry, totally intractable number. So you, there's no way you'd ever be able to test them on all the things. Now, there's only a subset of those, presumably, that are important, but it's a pretty big subset. Using these analyses, we could put somebody in the scanner, get the pattern of their activity for each individual task, a problem that scales linearly with the number of tasks that you're interested in, and then infer from the covariation matrix of the patterns of activity under lots of very strong assumptions um, that we're now trying to test. Um, but in principle, we should be able to measure from the pattern of fMRI activity, assuming that sort of captures the intermediate you know, associative units, the correlation of those structure of those, what the interference graph is, and then use these graph theoretic analyses to predict exactly which multitasks are likely and which are not. And if you have that, you might be able to know how to train them better. So I think this actually might even, you know, um, have some practical significance. We're, we're putting to the test now whether we have enough resolution with fMRI to do that. And, and I'll say a little bit more about that at the end. But that sort of gets us to the last part of the talk, which is fine, okay, so you buy it that even with a very large system, modest amounts of overlap in or sharing of representations causes trouble, then you can ask, well, why the hell do we do it? Why don't we just develop dedicated representations, right? Why don't I have two phonologic codes if I'm going to be a Stroop researcher so I can show off how I can do, like, you know, two things at once? And so there's a really sort of clear answer these days, which is that with shared representations, you can learn faster and you can support generalization. And here again, I have Dave Romalhart and Jay McClung and Jeff Hinton, who have, you know, sort of laid the groundwork for that in the mid-'80s. And then more recent investigators, these are some of their students um, who are doing really exceptional work in sort of bringing that notion forward in the psychological domain. Um, but all you have to do is go to NIPS to learn about this in the machine learning um, you know, uh, domain. I mean, literally 90% of NIPS is how, how can we find, how can we, you know, it's called multi, it's a bad sort of unfortunate similarity of terms. They call it um, multitask learning, not multitasking. 
So when I talk about multitasking, I talk about simultaneous performance. When they talk about multitask learning, they say, listen, if I train something on lots of different tasks, maybe it'll extract the similarity structure among those so that it can generalize better into domains within those tasks that it hasn't been exposed to, and maybe even other similar tasks, right? So this whole notion of multitask learning, which is literally probably the most commonly used term at NIPS these days, is all about how to get networks to better extract shared representations in the service of faster learning and better generalization. Okay? So this is the deal in machine learning, and it's, it's the deal in your head, too. So I promised you that I would have you demonstrate to me that what I'm claiming has some, um, you know, some, some veracity. So let's do it. Um, we're going to do three tasks. Okay? Um, the first one, I just want to show you that um, you know, multitasking is, even in the Stroop domain, is not, is not you know, impossible. So I'm going to put up a Stroop stimulus the word red and green, or blue and yellow, and I want you to do the Stroop test this time. So this time I want you to name the color, okay? But it's going to appear on one side of the screen or the other, and I just want you to point at the stimulus where you saw it. So you're going to name the color. So if it was green and red ink, you'd say red and point to the left. Everybody get it? Okay. You think this is going to be like super hard, hardish, easy-ish, or super easy? So I heard a mumbling. How many people are going to speak super hard? Nobody. OK, that's all I needed to know. <laughs> OK, ready? Set, go. Very good. There you go. It was actually not bad. And you were probably pretty good at predicting that it was easy. OK? Easy-ish. All right, so I'll leave it to Yeah, thank you. <laughs> OK, next task. This time we're going to do word reading. OK, I want you to look at the word and read it, but I don't want you to say it out loud. No speaking out loud. You speak out loud, you lose, okay? Just look at the word, and if the word is red, point left. So this is the example I gave earlier, right? And if the word is green, I want you to point right. So red, practice, point, left, good, green, point right, thank you, okay, ready? Oh, hard or easy? Mostly hard easy, okay? There you go. Not a big deal, right? One trial learning. OK, last task. Same exact thing, red point left, green point right, but I want you to name the color. OK, I don't even have to ask you. You're laughing. You know, right? But, uh, everybody's pointing in a different direction. I didn't hear anybody say anything, right? It's not possible. This is an eyeball effect experiment. I don't like showing it to my students because it makes them think that they don't have to do statistics. Here are the results, OK? This is like, I don't know, this is like 30 undergraduates. We've done this many times now. And we're doing an experiment in the scanner that I'll tell you about in a moment where we've got people doing this thousands of times. And that's what it takes to be able to do this. So here's the first task. These are not at, at the levels that you were performing, actually, even, because we imposed a constraint to calling it correct that you had to respond to both within one standard deviation of the slowest, right? So you couldn't take time to serialize it. That, you know, and, and, and so you know, people aren't perfect at sort of blurting out and responding right away. These are sort of unfamiliar tasks. But you know, they do pretty damn well at multitasking, color naming, and location pointing. They're actually even better in this case at this new task, but absolutely are unable to do this, right? And they're below chance because they're actually saying something that is meaningful, which is they're responding to the word, right? So, and, and just to show you that's not speed accuracy, there you go. So, you know, I've already sort of shown you, but I'll go over it really quickly again, um, that this is the Stroop effect, right? That's Stroop. And now I've asked you to do something in the first task that's not the Stroop effect, but it's unrelated to it, right? So it's a distinct input and output dimension. There's no overlap, and so you do that fine, right? And now, I give you a new task, and the obvious thing to do is to take representations you have that you know how to encode in order to generate the right response and just map those to the new response that you've learned, and you have no problem doing that. But now, when I ask you to do this and that together, because you've used those representations for this task, right, and you've opened up, so when you're doing this, you're presumably intentionally suppressing the verbal response, right? Which is fine. That's why you get away with doing it. You don't like look at it and mistakenly say it. Maybe you might even feel a little bit of subvocalization, but you don't say it out loud because you can suppress this. You can raise the threshold here, right? But the minute you have to like lower the threshold because now you have to name the color, you're screwed. You've got this latent pathway, or it's not so latent, but this, this very strong pathway, this latent task, I should say, right, that you can't suppress. And that's why you can't do this task. Now, 
The fact is, you could have done this, right? When you learn this new task, you could have created a new separate, separate set of representations. But you showed me that you didn't because you couldn't do the task. If you had done this, you could have done the task. Right? So you couldn't do the task, and I take that as a strong inference that you didn't do this, you did this. Okay? And so then the question is, well, why? Ah, or you could have even done this. But sorry. So here's the more sort of abstract characterization okay, that sort of puts it in, in, in maybe slightly more quantitative terms, and I'm going to show you some simulations, and then um, actually close to on time end with a few speculations. So here's a space, in this case, of three input dimensions and three output dimensions. So from that, we could imagine nine kinds of tasks. If we think about tasks as mapping stimuli in one dimension to in an input dimension to an output dimension according to some you know, rule or, 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 or set of um, sort of set of you know, specified mappings. Um, and so this is a compact way, right? I take every input, I represent it, and then I map it, that representation, to each of the possible outputs that I need. Um, and it only costs me about, you know, whatever, three pools of associative units and, and maybe, you know, these six control units, one for each of the, the, the associative uh, representations and one for each of the output representations. Um, but it won't allow me to do multitasking. In, in, in sort of linear algebraic terms, it's a rank one matrix. Right? You can only represent one thing here unambiguously. If you try and do two, you can see that you get exactly into the problem that I, that I just showed you with regard to um, word pointing and color naming. Okay? So, you have the, so we call this the minimal basis set. It's a basis set in the sense that it spans the space of nine tasks. You can implement any of the nine tasks that you like, but at the expense of only doing one at a time. Okay? Yeah. Because if I, supposing I want to do this one and this one, okay? So to do this one, I have to turn this on and this on. And to do this one, I have to turn this on and this on. I could, you know, I could I basically, now it's turning on these control units, right? But then the minute I've turned this on and this on and that on to do this, I have this. Exactly, okay? I'm sharing the representations of the tasks from visual to facial with visual to manual and visual to verbal. Right? The alternative is to do exactly this, is to build a, what we'll call a tensor product representation, where I dedicate a set of representations for each possible task, each separate mapping, but it costs me more. Right? more it costs me now whatever, 9 plus 9 is 18. Right? I mean, so the arithmetic is sort of interesting. It scales, so it gets worse as you get bigger, but that's not really the point. The real point is that this is harder to learn, and in fact, there's closed form mathematical analyses. A beautiful paper by Andrew Sachs working with Suryu Ganguly and Jay McClellan showing that if you treat this as a linear system and you ask, I'll, I'll blurt it out here because I think so at least some of you are sophisticated enough to follow what I'm saying, but if you ask, what they've shown is that in a hierarchically organized space where there's structure as there is in these spaces, and you train it up, training a network like the linear network is tantamount to learning, to doing the single value, de single value decomposition, to basically learn, doing PCA, right? And what they showed is that the eigenvalues, the eigenvectors with the largest eigenvalues are learned first. And so you can think about these as sort of representing and corresponding to eigenvectors that, that have capture more variance, right? They have bigger eigenvalues, right? Because they're going to be engaged more than these guys. Each of these guys only captures a ninth of the variance, whereas each of these captures a third of the variance. So these are learned before these in PCA, you know, period, right? And now the question is, does this apply in, in nonlinear networks? And so here's a little simulation to show you that it does. Um, so here we train up a network first just on single task training, and we trained it on all nine tasks, and we asked, and what you're going to see, I'm sorry it's so dark, but there's going to be a little circle here for each of the nine tasks, sort of color-coded so that the reddish ones are all these three tasks, all the ones with red inputs and blue and green, but they're still distinct. And what you'll see, and, and sorry, this is just going to be a plot of its performance over time. This is MSC. We have better measures these days and actually much cleaner plots, but this is still pretty good, I think. Um, and so you'll see the performance come down. And as the performance come down, what you'll see is the representations. This is a PCA. In this case, it's just a straight up PCA. I mean, it's not great because it's a nonlinear system. PCA is not, you know, but it, it does not such a bad job. And what you'll see is that as this thing learns, it learns to break it up into a space of three sets of representations. And these are actually, that's three green circles, but they're all overlapping, OK? And just to make that really clear, what happens if we train it now instead of just on single tasks, but on multitasking? It starts by doing exactly the same thing. So it first breaks up into these three, the minimal basis set, as I described it, right, into three rings of similar colors. 
And then it splits up. And in order to solve the multitasking, now we're forcing it to do two and three things at once. Now it has to build the tensor product. But it only does that after having first extracted the minimal basis set. And we now have extensions of the linear systems analysis to at least certain, under certain assumptions, nonlinear systems. And they show more or less the same properties. So this is a fundamental property of learning. Right, that it wants to extract lower dimensional representations. And you know, as I said, the machine learning community realizes this is a, an advantage, and our brains obviously figured that out too. And so when you learn, you try and find the most efficient solution you can. That's a, that's a shared representation in this terminology, but that's the expense of being able to multitask. And so this should now sort of strike chords of familiarity. When you first learn to do just about anything, not true of everything. Like when you learned grammar, you didn't learn it in grade school, you learned it when you were two, right? So you didn't have a day where you suddenly realized that the predicate of a subject of SVC always has to be inflected with the subjunctive tense, you know, right? No, didn't do any of that. But lots of other stuff, most other stuff I'd say goes the other way. When you learned to drive a stick shift car, if you did, or when you first learned to um, ride a bike even, right? Nobody could talk to you when you were doing that, right? You had to sort of really think about each piece and sort of focus on that, and it was pretty serial. Like when you first learned to, 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 to drive a stick shift car, you learned the order in which to put the brake, you know, the clutch in, and then put it into gear, and then release the clutch while you release the brake, and then maybe press the gas. And that's not all exactly parallel, but it's pretty close in time. And certainly, you're not a very good driver if you all do it all exactly sequentially. It's much better to sort of take the clutch off, your foot off the clutch, and sort of hit the gas around the same time, right? Um, and yet, it takes a long time for you to learn to do that. And I'll come back to that in just a second, but I think it's exactly what's going on here. I think this trajectory that Schifrin and Schneider so beautifully documented in their 1977 paper is exactly, I think, this trajectory from minimal basis set representation, which gets you in the game fast, but is not efficient, it's serial, to tensor product representations, which afford you fluidity, parallelism, efficiency, okay? So I think this is a fundamental principle. I think it's a fundamental principle not just of, um, you know, of, of the brain, but of computing in general in network spaces. So you know, interactive parallelism is what deep learning is all about. It's many small interaction, interacting computations in the service of some single coherent higher level representation. You know, the field of computer vision spent three, four decades trying to use se serial sequential processes, symbolic processes, to extract relevant features, to recognize faces, and it just didn't do it. Right? What did it take? It took a system that has lots of little computing devices all talking to each other, sort of mutually interacting to satisfy the constraints that are needed to deal with the incredibly high combinatoric space of all the features in a face right? or any other object. And so the, the success of deep learning is exactly that. It's at the core of the PDP and, and, and you know, was from the beginning. Um, and again, I credit people like Dave Rummelhart and Jay McClellan for sort of seeing that and building the technology to do it. Um, but it, fundamentally, it relies on shared representations, OK? If you take in, in, um, um, AlexNet and give it two images at the same time, it can't do it, right? Or if you ask it to tell you where's the cat and where's the dog at the same time, it can't do it. And in fact, the solution to that problem that Fei Fei Li came up with is to build an LSTM that sequentially goes through the labeling tasks and first does one and then does the next. Why? Because it's using the same set of representations, right? And it needs to be able to sort of separate out the purposes to which they're being put for the different tasks you're asking it to do. Okay? And that's in contrast to what sort of um, evolved in the computing community under the constraint that all processing had to be serial and independent was massive parallelism, which of course is extremely powerful in certain settings, right? So in, what I'll call independent parallelism is when you take lots of what are separable and unrelated computations that don't need to sort of interact with each other, right? And then you build lots of cores to deal with that. It's a classic massive, you know, sort of multi-core, multi-node processing architecture. Um, and you can be incredibly efficient. I mean, we exploit that all the time. But it relies fundamentally on the idea that the, that the, that the computations have to be separable. Right? You have to dedicate sort of separate representations for each. Right? But this gives you something like multitasking and automaticity. And so I think what the brain is doing when it's going from control to automatic processing is it's starting with this, which is a powerful way of getting into a system, inferring, generalizing, learning quickly, but at the cost of this constraint, the seriality, and then moving eventually as it gains expertise in a domain um, uh, to, to these sort of more separated tensor product-like representations. So this just sort of summarizes that. Um, I guess I've already said that. Uh, and I think this sort of, to me, 
speaks to a beautiful example of what it means for there to be bounded rationality. Here the bound, though, is not like too little working memory or too few cores. It's like a fundamental principle of computation. You can't have your cake and eat it. You can't have separated and shared representations at the same time. You have to make your choice. Each has its advantages. When do you want one? When do you want the other? And it, although we're still sort of pursuing empirical work to try and document this, so we have actually as I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, Abby Novick in my lab is actually running experiments with students who are training on the exact task that you did, that color naming and word pointing task, and, and, but now over thousands of trials. And, and we've gotten them to proficiency where they really can multitask that pretty much perfectly. But we've been scanning them all along. And the goal is to show that when they first start out, the representation that they use for words when they have to point is the same one through representational similarity analysis, right, as the one they use when they read the word out loud. And we have them reading the word in, the, in this case, right? But as they gain proficiency, what predicts their proficiency is the extent to which the representational similarity analysis starts to fail. That is to say, they develop new representations for words in the context of word pointing itself. They develop tensor product representations, right? So there's still, I think, work to be done to sort of really just pin this down empirically. We're on that. But the really interesting work, I think, is now in taking the meta question on, which is how does the brain know when to do one or the other? And I think this is an intertemporal choice. Um, I can get by quickly, right? And yet it's at an expense. So is it worth it for me? And so these are the people that are doing this work, uh, Andrew Sachs, who we're working with, who's the one who did the, the sort of linear systems analysis, and a new graduate student in, in the lab, um, Yotam Sagiv, um, who won the Cognitive Science Best Paper Award for this, for this work. Um, it, it's something like this, right? Like, how do we know when it's OK to hunt and peck at the keyboard or on the, the piano? Like, if I'm just a novelist and I'm getting paid in, you know, for delivery in months and not in minutes, right? Um, or I'm interested in entertaining my six-year-old nephew by, you know, hunting and pecking on the keyboard and tapping out, uh, you know, twinkle, twinkle, little star, and that's all I care about, not interested in being a concert pianist, versus deciding, no, that's not enough. You know, I'm not making a living and as a neuroscientist, I better go out and try and become a concert pianist or a stenographer. And so I better go take time out, spend money, and put the effort in for a later reward, right? So it's going to be a near-term investment for a reconfiguration that will get me something later. And there's got to be some sort of meta-analytic processes that both recognize when you can and can't perform. And that's why I asked you whether you knew whether it was going to be hard or not. What's really amazing is that you knew really quickly that that one task that involved multitasking wasn't going to work, but the, other one, the first one would, right? How do you know that? Do you simulate the test in your head? Do you have some sort of function approximation for what things invoke conflict and what ones don't? I don't know. But those are the interesting questions. And then how does the system use that information to sort of conduct active learning, basically, and decide when you, it's worth investing in becoming a good driver and when it's fine to just sort of, you know, you know, sort of, you know, um, sort of faultingly, you know, falteringly drive along the streets, hit, you know, grinding your clutch every, every turn. So, um, that's the story. Here are the people. I, I really can't give enough credit to the people who sort of laid the groundwork for these ideas um, in their groundbreaking work, and then all the people that I've been working with, which is a, a remarkable mix of psychologists, engineers, mathematicians, and computer scientists to try and wrestle this beast to the ground. And, and um, so, and you for, for listening. Thank you. Think of those as tensor products in, in a sort of limited sense. Like you have, a, you know, you have a, a brainstem nucleus for breathing. I mean, the, the body decided that was so important, it better be isolated you know, from all this other stuff, modulo its need to be modulated for whatever purposes breathing needs to be modulated. Long-term evolution has done a lot of those things for us. At the low levels. The lymphatic nerve versus the yep. vestibular nerve versus the optic nerve. Yep. They're all about the same size, but hugely different companies. Yep. How does that story fit in? I guess it fits in the sense that on longer time scales, evolution yeah. is also doing all these things. Yeah. That, I, that's the easy one. Yes. I thought you were going to ask me the hard question, which is, okay. yeah. Oh, okay. Maybe you are. <laughs> Completely wrong 
Well, there's always an element of that, right? I mean, culture and technology are evolving so quickly that it's got to be true that evolution can't solve the problems that we're facing, um, or all the problems, many of the problems we're facing these days. And that, that's sort of a fundamentally interesting thing and, and, and um, something that would be tempting to sort of go off on. I've been very interested in that question just. Uh, no, but oh, but wait, but wait, but but oh, sorry, sorry, I misunderstood. The sort of the genetic contribution to it isn't helping us, but we clearly have this intermediate capability, which is training the plastic. I'm arguing this is an argument about at least one of the primary functions of plasticity, right? Which is to carve out spaces for things that need to be done fluidly, right, and not basically build overpasses where you know there's a lot of traffic and you can't afford to have a, have a, have a, have a signal, right? But, and, and, you, and you don't need it to be flexible. One of the consequences of developing automaticity that again has been known from the beginnings of, of work in this area is that not only do you get fluid, but it becomes impenetrable to, to the same level of intervention. So once I get good at playing something on a piano, I can't tell you exactly where my finger is. I mean, that's an odd thing, because when I started out, that's exactly what I was paying total attention to. Right? I didn't explain this, but maybe I should make that analogy or that, that example a little bit clearer. The reason that you're able to hunt and peck is that you have some shared procedural, in this case, representation of how to take a finger and some specification, a letter you know, corresponding to a, a letter on a keyboard or a, a letter corresponding to a note on a piano um, you know, keyboard, um, and then move a finger in the direction of the mapping indicated you know, on your, your, your table that says this letter is in that spot on, you know, on, on, on the keyboard, or maybe you, know, you see it. And, and, and you have the same one for all your fingers. So I can do that really well. It doesn't matter which finger I use for that because it's almost like your arm, right? I mean, there's one representation for that. In order to play chords, though, I can't do that. I have to now have separate mappings for each one of these guys. Right? And it raises an interesting question. In some cases, those mappings are correlated, and so that makes it easier. In some cases, they're not. There's true independence. Like a really good pianist can sort of pick which of the pieces of the chord they're going to emphasize more or pick to play. Right? So in the limit, there really are independent, isolated bits of rep mapping representations, and we have the capacity to build those. So I think that... The point, though, is that the ones that we can do like that yeah. depend very specifically on hardware that was happened to evolve. Oh. There's just certain things hmm. we absolutely can't multitask, and the hardware just isn't there oh. to do that decomposition. Well, well no, I mean, there, I, I, so but you started by saying the hardware is there for doing the decomposition. Why would you say the hardware is not there for doing the decomposition? I think it's, I think I, that I disagree with. I think the hardware is there for doing just about any decomposition that the laws of physics will allow you to do. I mean, I can't put my hand in two places at once, but I can certainly get either one of my hands to do just about it. I mean, you've seen these guys that, you know, play five instruments at the same time, right? So I don't think there's any limit on the decomposition that physics doesn't, that, that physics allows. Okay. But, Okay, well, there, there is, a, there is a, 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 an amendment to that statement, but maybe I'll take another question. Well, so, okay, if that were true, I should be able to learn to do mental arithmetic and plan at the same time, right? I don't think that's a hardware constraint. I think that's a fundamental nature of what it means to do mental arithmetic. And in fact, I can learn to do that. So I could probably get pretty good at doing memorizing multiplication tables or addition tables, right? Um, and, and in fact, there are examples of people who can do that, as you, of course, know, right? There are even examples, there's one example, I, I took the slide out because I already had too many, but, but there's an example from the early 1900s that a psychologist found of a Russian woman who could write in two different languages different sentences at the same time, perfectly grammatically and coherently. She had somehow tensor product her language representations. Who the hell knows how it happened? Right? We weren't there to observe it, so maybe it was confabulated. I don't know. But I can imagine that happening in the limit. But I think there's a strong constraint that starts to get imposed. The more general the nature of the representation you try and allocate, because that's going against the grain of what they're there for. Language is explicitly meant to be general. And so the minute you carve it off and dedicate it, you don't, you're not going to call it language anymore. So you're only going to call it language, and math, of course, is a language, if it has this purely general characteristic, which by definition almost means it has to have a share, you know, it has to be using the same representation for lots of different purposes. Right? So I think there's an equally fundamental sense in which, for some reason, there are some categories of tasks that so are bound to the notion of the representation being general, being shared, that 
you could decompose them, but then they wouldn't be what you want to call them. OK? Um, you did something in it requesting the challenging task that made it more difficult. Do you know what it was? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you're the, saying. The, oh, the point left when you read the word green, green or whatever direction it was and, yeah. and call out the name of the color. Yeah. The instructions that were in writing were not ambiguous, but when you gave the verbal instructions, oh, that was by mistake. you said when you see red point instead of saying when you see the written word red. Yeah, that, that was just my oversight. And so the, uh, do the, me noted, I won't do that again. <laughs> I, I think it was interesting, though, because it well, made the task harder. Because it, the fair enough, but that's not what's accounting for the variance here. And that I, I can tell you, Abby is a much better experimentalist than I've become. <laughs> and, and she doesn't give them any verbal instructions. It's just what you see on the page. So I, I appreciate your care and your, your attention to detail. Yeah, I, I hear you. I, I, the t I totally get it, and you're right. Maybe I confounded things by sloppiness, but that's not what's explaining the phenomenon. Do you, do you mind putting the slide where you have the results for the for the speed at which the representations arise? This one. There you go. The one data slide. That one. No, well, it doesn't. Oh. Earlier. We passed them. It's okay. It's okay. Let me ask you a question. I, I just thought it was going to help to, to put context. You, you make the argument, based on your data, that uh, when you have the possibility of these uh, tens of representations, these very complex representations, that you learn first the simple representations, that those arise first, and only later the, the more complex representations appear. The question is, um, imagine that I train you in a very biased situation. For example, instead of sampling tasks randomly, I always sample you in a strange combination. So like always force multi multitasking. Tasking. Then it learns that first. Then it learns, the, OK, that's, that was okay. just checking. Thank you. I mean, th there, are, there are a lot of other factors that I just don't have, you know, don't have the time to talk about here. But, but um, initialization is a big deal. So if you initialize the network with large random weights, it's already favoring tensor products, and you can get it to learn them faster. Typically, though, things are initialized with small random weights exactly to favor shared representations. And in that case, depending upon other things like how many layers, and by the way, this extends to multi-layer networks. We have lots of evidence uh, or examples. Um, you, can, you can mitigate the effect, right? And in some cases, even get it to learn multitasking first. But it's subject to these other constraints. So if you start with small random weights, it, it almost always learns the minimal basis at first. But yeah. Um, that, that actually ties in pretty closely to my question. So you mentioned that uh, in machine learning, you kind of got this like hack where you kind of run it through an LSTM, and then you can create jet, the split representations just by doing it again. Um, and there's the kind of obvious solution of just you know this general idea of intertemporal choice and deliberative training to create these representations. I'm just wondering if you have any intuitions about how without that kind of you know, long-term investment and without this kind of sense of, kind of cognitive control, are there, there are any other ways that you think you could bias representations to be separated within humans, like given, given our biology? Well, I think uh, you know, the same thing as said to Antonio. I mean, I, th I think if you, if, you create the if you create a biased environment where you know, all of the goods come from doing things fluidly, you can, you'll learn it faster. But you know, I think, I think there are limits to that. I, th I think there's something, I mean, you know, these are very simple task spaces. But if you get into more complex task spaces, then the shared represent, it's not just about sharing representations, it's about, in, in some sense, um, passage points in, in graph spaces. Like, it turns out that certain representations are needed to build others, right? And in many cases, in order to build sequential representations that all should share the same structure, you need to start with the shared representations to sort of act as an inductive bias on what the later things need to be, even if eventually you can sort of, you can separate out that initial representation. So like tennis players, you know, are taught, I mean, when you're taught something like tennis, you're, you could just be throwing the ball at you and just, just keep, just keep, just keep playing, right? And just, just hit the ball, hit the ball. But no, they, they break it down because there's a sense that if you gain certain habits, right, certain lower dimensional kernels, if you will, of behavior, then you can build up better ones later, right? And so I think there's, there's, an, it, there's a lot to this space that I haven't talked about at all, which that, that comes from the sequential dependencies of behaviors and tasks. These are all about what we call flat tasks. Um, so I, I think even though you could try to bias 
more towards quicker separation, that might screw you if, if it's a situation that involves some sort of sequential dependency. So I, I think there's lots to be learned here. I, mean, I think in some sense this is just the tip of the iceberg, right? Um, and, and maybe we'll find out that in certain test phases it would be better to do that, right? To, to build up tensor products before you build up sort of um, lower dimensional representations. But I, I think, and you know, machine learning is of course on this too. And I think we're going to see as much in machine learning on these questions as, as, as you'll see from psychologists. But well, it's, it seems to me that it has a lot to do with um, education as well. Yeah. Oh, I, I mean, ultimately, yeah. I mean, I think education, reasoning itself, is about what are the right basis sets for dealing with a domain. And this is exactly right, right? I mean, this is exactly what we're talking about. What are the right basis sets? I gave you a very simple and small example, but it's pretty complex. Yeah. 